Hello everyone, this is Andy Nowicki, your right-wing English teacher. Today I want to cover a bit from Hamlet, from a specific monologue in Hamlet, that is one of the lesser known, or, or not maybe lesser known, but lesser discussed, less discussed, quotations of Hamlet. And as I've said before, you know, Hamlet is just the greatest character ever written and he is so erudite and so interesting in just about everything that he says that even the stuff that you've never heard of him saying before even the the one word comments that he gives the the heckling that he that he gives uh the actors in the play within the play scene uh even his uh, wormwood wormwood declaration um, everything. There, there's not really a line uh, anywhere in Hamlet that's that's that you don't look at and can't appreciate and can't think, wow, this is really something. There's really a lot here. Um, but I want to talk about uh, something that, again, isn't maybe as obscure as, as uh, what I was just alluding to, but it's more obscure. It's obscure enough to be declared maybe uh, a B-side uh, for uh, in Hamlet's greatest hits. This isn't, maybe doesn't make the, the, uh, the main album, but it's still a worthy B-side. And of course, Hamlet's B-sides are as, as good as, better than most of our A-sides. And this is all, you know, saying all this is still with you know, keeping in mind that Hamlet is a deeply flawed character. I don't mean to minimize his flaws, but even his flaws make him more interesting as a character. And uh, in some ways, <clears throat> more um, sympathetic, strangely enough, <clears throat> as a character. He's all the more relatable for, uh, for all of his... Uh, erudition and high intelligence and, uh, you know, extreme uh, insight into everything. And also his, his uh, deep and abiding confusion. So, in Act 3, this is after the play within the play scene, Hamlet is told by Polonius that he needs to go and see his mother that his mother wants to talk to him. His mother is displeased with him because Hamlet has just staged this play which has upset the king greatly and caused just just a great deal of, of uh, disarray within the kingdom. And uh, the reason for that is because this, the play that Hamlet staged is a play in which a man uh, who is the brother of a king murders his brother and then marries the queen, uh, murders him uh, with poison by pouring poison in his ear. And of course, this is uh, Hamlet's experiment to see whether Claudius is really guilty of what he was told that he was guilty of by the ghost of his father. And after this is over, Hamlet is ecstatic. Now he knows that it must be true because he saw how Claudius behaved. He, he uh, reached the conscience of the king. He caught the conscience of the king, found Claudius out. And uh, you'd think he would take immediate action, but no, he continues to delay action. But anyway, all of that aside, that's just the wider context for this this scene and this, this particular monologue, this particular soliloquy. So uh, Hamlet messes with Polonius a little bit, uh, as he's done before, you know, talks about how this cloud looks like a weasel, and uh, no, it looks like a whale rather than a weasel. And Claudius, I mean, Polonius just doesn't know what to do with him, and he knows that he's causing trouble, but he doesn't really have the wits uh, to, to, to match with Hamlet. So, um, so he tells him, "I'm gonna, I'll be be by my mother's, I'll come by my mother's room when I feel like it. By and by." He tells him that and uh, dismisses him. 
And then we see Hamlet alone. And again, remember, when we have a character speaking in a soliloquy on stage with no other characters present, this means we're hearing from this character, right from this character's heart. There's no pretense involved when, there's, when a soliloquy is delivered. It's all sincere, it's all direct, and uh, we, we are hearing the pure inner thoughts of this character. And this is what Hamlet says in this comparatively short soliloquy. He says, "'Tis now the very witching time of night, when churchyards yawn, and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the bitter day would quake to look on. So this is really something. This is quite, these are quite powerful lines. Hamlet says this is, this is the witching time of night. He feels the evil and the coalescing in the air. Um, and hell is breathing contagion into the world. And he feels in some way drawn to this darkness. He, he feels that uh, he could drink hot blood. He could take part in, you know, some ritualistic kind of uh, uh, event, some ritual, some ritual, um, some demonic ritual and then do such bitter business as the bitter day would quake to look on. Now what's notable here is Hamlet really seems to be reveling in this, this whole feeling, this sensation of wanting to drink hot blood and do such, and do bitter business, do bitter business, murderous business, destructive business. Um, you know, murder and maybe worse than murder. He's just, you know, he's very much feeling his oats in a way, you could say it, say it like that, because he's feeling very powerful. He's just gotten to the, the conscience of the king. He knows that the ghost was right. He knows that he is in the right. Uh, and he feels this temptation. He's aware that it's a temptation, but he feels it. You know, you know when, you're, when you're tempted to do something that you know you shouldn't do, but you still really like the feeling, and you maybe... Uh, linger in that feeling a little bit longer than you should, you know, when you, since you know it's wrong. This is the, the state of mind that Hamlet is in at this moment. Uh, he's, about to, he's about to talk to his mother and speak to her uh, openly, directly, for the first time about how exactly he feels towards her. Remember, this is the woman whom he just despises at this moment for what she has done. Uh, the betrayal that uh, she has committed against his father and against nature um, by uh, marrying his uncle so soon after his father's death and what that suggests about her and how that suggests her frailty, frailty thy name as a woman, meaning her weakness, meaning that uh, being a woman, she's, she is, uh, she has no uh, real loyalty, uh, the loyalty that she should have had to her husband who loved her so, uh, so deeply. And with such fervor, she loses it immediately after his death and marries so soon afterwards, just because, uh, just out of, he thinks it must be lust, which is of course, uh, a terrible thing for him to think about. It's terrible for any of us to think of, her, of our mothers, of our parents, uh, being lustful. It's just gross, you know, for one thing. But for another thing, Hamlet says, you know, it's, it's just unseemly. You know, you're, uh, you should be loyal to the memory of your husband and you should live, live out the rest of your days properly uh, in the purity of widowhood rather than just rushing to incestuous sheets with uh, your, your, uh, your, hus your proper husband's brother, Claudius. So this is all the rage that he's feeling at this moment. And this is, you know, what's building up in his heart and what he feels in the air. You know, this is kind of like Phil Collins, I, I can feel it coming in the air tonight. I've been waiting for this moment all my life. This is 
very much the vibe of this scene. Um, but he, then, he, then he says to himself, soft, now to my mother. He kind of talks himself down here. O oh, heart, lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. The soul of Nero, meaning Nero the emperor, who was so well known for his depravity uh, and degeneracy and cruelty and evil. Let, uh, O oh heart, lose not thy nature. You know, he's, his heart is sorely tempted to lose its nature and to give itself over to this darkness. But uh, he says, let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. And then he, this is the interesting line. Uh, it's always struck me as interesting. He says, let me be cruel, not unnatural. That's uh, an interesting way of putting it, to be, to be sure. Um, we generally think of cruelty as a, as a thing to avoid, as, as you know, a bad way to be. But Hamlet, in a, di in a different uh, uh, line in the s same play, uh, says, uh, I'm cruel only to be kind. He says that uh, uh, to Ophelia, or of his, his relating to Ophelia with cruelty. He says he's cruel to be kind, <clears throat> cruel only to be kind. And here he says, let me be cruel, not unnatural. Um, so what does he mean by this? And why, uh, you know, th this sort of continues Hamlet's interesting use of language, interesting use of this word uh, uh, cruel, which most of us would think, you know, cruel is the thing, cruelty is a thing to avoid. Cruelty is a bad thing. Uh, way to be. It's a bad way to treat someone. But here he's saying, uh, I need to be cruel, but not unnatural. I can't let this cruelty, this proper cruelty, what he would see, what he categorizes here, whatever we may think of this, whatever we may think of his use of words here, what he categorizes here as proper cruelty, I can't let that, uh, shade into uh, the heart of Nero, which would be unnatural. Okay, he goes on to say, I will speak daggers to her, meaning his mother, but use none. My tongue and soul in this be hypocrites, how in my words, so never she may she be shent to give them seals never my soul consent. So, I will speak daggers to her, but use none. And he does, as, as, we'll, as we see in the scene that follows. Uh, he does indeed speak daggers to his mother. Uh, this is, I believe, the, the, the scene at the very beginning of... Uh, well, no, it's still Act 3. The scene I was just talking about was Act 3, Scene 2. Uh, and then uh, the following scene is the one in which he speaks daggers to his mother and also commits a rash and bloody deed... Uh, against Polonius, his first ac actual act of violence in the play, where he hears Polonius hiding behind the, the curtain and stabs him, thinking that he's Claudius, uh, and uh, ends up murdering the, the the mother. I mean, sorry, the father of uh, the girl that he loves, but the one who's rejected him and who, whom he's told off in this previous scene, get thee to a nunnery, etc. Et so I just wanted to focus in on this, this particular scene because I think it is interesting. The use of language is interesting. Whenever we see language um, altered in its usage in a way that's unfamiliar to us, there's something going on there. There's something interesting and, and, and noteworthy uh, about, about that. And of course, Shakespeare does that a lot. And Hamlet, Shakespeare's greatest creation, does that in spades, and we, he does it here particularly with this term cruelty, um, wherein it's proper to be cruel. You know, again, in his formulation, he needs to be cruel to his mother, uh, but not unnatural. That would be wrong if he were unnatural. 
And when he says, I will speak daggers, but use none, this implies that he is, feels tempted to murder his mother for what she's done. And that his anger is so great, he has so much rage towards her because he feels betrayed by her. And he feels that, uh, you know, uh, he, he, uh, he loved her, he admired her uh, prior to the events of this play. But after uh, she showed such disrespect to his father's memory, by remarrying Claudius uh, so soon afterwards, you know, this is, you know, it's often said that the most, uh, I can't think of a, of a compact way of saying this. I think there's some phrase that sums this up, but I'll just, I'll just try to explain it. It's often said that the idealist who is disappointed, who finds, his, that, who finds out that his ideals are shattered, no one ever is more bitter than him after, after he finds his ideals shattered, after he finds that the person that he believed in, uh, turned, like, the mother that he believed in to be chaste turned out to be a whore. Uh, that really uh, just, just tore him apart and made him very, very angry. And it was, it's the animating force more than his hatred of Claudius, I would argue. You know, he does, he, he does very, very strongly uh, dislike Claudius, thinks that he's not a fitting, uh, he's, he's not fit to unloose the soles of his father's sandals, to put it in biblical terms. <clears throat> or as he puts it in Act 1, um, uh, he's no more like my father than I, than I to Hercules. Um, or he's like, uh, uh, comparing Claudius to my father is like uh, comparing Hyperion uh, uh, to a satyr, that his father's like Hyperion, this, this golden, beautiful god, and uh, Claudius is like a satyr, an ugly uh, creature, uh, satanic-looking creature, gnarled, uh, despicable creature. So uh, he, he he hates Claudius, but he but he's he's so much angrier with his mother because he once thought of his mother. Uh, as uh, a vessel of purity, um, and as a faithful wife, and a faithful mother. But now, in this coming scene, he has to restrain himself. He feels this, this demonic, evil, empowering, you know, he feels himself filled with the dark side of the Force, to put it uh, that way. You know, uh, like the Emperor says uh, in Return of the Jedi, your hate has made you powerful. He says that to Luke before Luke finally decides to resist going over to the dark side. And here, Hamlet is is considering the dark side. He feels it very strongly within his bones. It's the witching hour where he could drink hot blood and do such bloody deeds um, as the bitter day would quake to look upon. But he's got to restrain himself. He's got to be cruel. He's got to be cruel. It's necessary in his mind to be cruel, but he's got to refrain from being unnatural. Just an interesting use of wording there. Thanks for watching. I am Andy Nowicki, the right-wing English teacher.